Welcome to the second video on the third chapter. In the first video we talked a little bit about what an action potential is and we also talked about the fact that for instance it's an all or nothing proposition. So either it fires at full force or it doesn't fire at all. In this lecture we're going to talk a little bit more about the nuts and bolts. How does this actually happen? Why does it happen? Um, and just helping you understand the process and the reason why it's an all or nothing um, event. So with the first chapter, you'll, or the first um, video rather, you'll likely remember that there are gated ion channels. And these channels can either open or close, either granting access or blocking access um, to the cell for different ions. Well, one of the most important ion channels as far as action potentials are voltage-gated sodium channels. And they're called voltage-gated because whether or not they open or close depends on the voltage within the cell. So that's the trigger. The voltage is the trigger. With the sodium channels, they actually open when the cell is at negative 40 millivolts. So when the cell depolarizes to negative 40 millivolts, it causes them to open. And when they open, you have to remember the charge in the cell is negative. So with that, sodium comes rushing into the cell because these are positive sodium cations. So they start flooding the cell because of that electrostatic pressure, because of the charge differential. This causes a spike in the cell's voltage and it goes actually all the way up to positive 40 millivolts. So you have a massive change in the voltage. At least on a cellular level it's a massive change. Um, at first, only a couple of these cell voltage gates open. So it starts out a little slow, but it picks up rather quickly because the more the cell depolarizes, the more these gates open. So while this process takes a little time, as you can imagine, it actually happens extremely rapidly. So the whole process that we described here actually happens in less than a millisecond. So it's very, very quick that these, you know, sodium rush into the cell. Now, why does it stop at positive 40 millivolts? Well, what happens is for the sodium, um, you actually have it balanced between the concentration gradient and the positive charge forcing them out. So at this point, there's still more sodium outside the cell. So the concentration gradient is trying to push more sodium in, whereas the charge is pushing them out. So for sodium, they're perfectly balanced at this point. However, potassium wants out. So now that the cell is positively charged, the cations, of course, are being pushed out to the charge. So with this, um, potassium wants out, and there are actually voltage-gated potassium gates. And at roughly positive 40 millivolts, these potassium gates open that lets all the potassium, all the positive potassium out of the cell. And this reduces the positive charge in the neuron and starts sending it back toward where it started. And we'll discuss that process here in a second. So this process will actually take place down the entire length of the axon. It just happens one after another after another. So the signal is actually equally as strong at the beginning as it is at the end because it's constantly renewing itself. It's this process constantly happening again and again down the length of the cell, down the length of the axon. So as you can see, you have the cell first at its resting potential at roughly negative 60 um, millivolts. Then when you hit negative 40, when you have enough excitement to depolarize the cell just up to negative 40, that's where you have all those sodium channels open. So the sodium channels open and sodium rushes into the cell. So all these positive sodium ions rush into the cell, rush into the cell, which gets you up here to roughly positive 40 millivolts. So at this point, remember, the sodium is balanced between the concentration gradient pushing it in and the charge pushing it out. But here's where the potassium ions open. 
and the potassium wants out because the charge is positive. So it pushes it up, pushes it up, pushes all the potassium out. And it actually pushes out so much, it overshoots a little bit. It actually goes, as you can see, further down, further negative than the resting potential. And we'll talk about this period in a second, but this is called, it's part of the refractory period. Um, so we'll talk about that momentarily. So it goes a little below the resting potential, and then it returns up to the resting potential. So a refractory period is a period where regardless of the amount of stimulation, um, the cell cannot fire. So it's actually been found that a neuron can only fire about 1,200 times a second. So about 1,200 times a second a neuron can fire. Um, can't fire any more than that. Um, and actually many can't even fire that much. And this is because of refractory periods. So a refractory period is the amount of time that either um, no amount of stimulus or only a great amount of stimulus can cause an action potential. During the absolute refractory period, an action potential cannot be produced regardless of how strong the stimulus is. And if you look back at the graph, um, the absolute refractory period right here is during this part where you have the sodium channels open. So bouncing back here, the reason why this is, is you have the sodium channels either open or unresponsive. So that's causing it so um, you can't have an action potential because remember, these sodium channels are what kick off the whole process. So action potential is impossible during the absolute refractory period because those sodium channels either are open or not responding. During the relative refractory period, only a very strong stimulus can produce an action potential. An example of this is when the potassium ions are still leaving the cell and it leads to brief hyperpolarization. So that's this part here. You could actually get enough stimulation to push it all the way up to negative 40 millivolts and make it go again. But during this part, it's harder to have another action potential because as you can see, it's further down. It's below its normal resting potential. So since it's, it requires more force to have the action potential, this is called the relative refractory period. As you can tell from our description of the process, just about everything has to go right with the channels opening and closing at the same time for the action potential to occur. However, there are actually some disorders or poisons that get in the way. And I always find this stuff interesting because it explains why these poisons have such an effect on us. So I think it's interesting. Hopefully you will too. Um, so channelopathy is actually a genetic abnormality that affects the ion channels and it's been linked to many different disorders. So for instance, sodium channelopathy um, has been associated with seizure disorders, muscle problems, heart problems, and it's also been shown to be um, associated with epilepsy. Um, there are also toxins that affect these channels. So um, tetrotoxin, um, I'm sure I mispronounced that, so I apologize for that. Um, it's actually found in the ovaries of Japanese pufferfish. And it's part of the reason why eating pufferfish, you have to make sure the right person, person cooks it because it can be a deadly dish if you don't cook it properly and prepare it properly. And there's also um, satsitoxin, which is a type of allergy that both prevents um, both of these, both the satsitoxin and the tetrotoxin, prevent the sodium channels from opening. So if the sodium channels can't open, the neuron can't fire. The neuron can't fire, you have paralysis and eventual death. So that's how those toxins work. They actually block the sodium channel from opening, so then you have paralysis, heart's paralyzed, breathing's paralyzed, eventual death. There's also the batrotoxin, 
and this is produced by the poison and the arrow frogs from South Africa. And this does the opposite. It actually forces the sodium channels to stay open, which leads to heart arrhythmias, so um, irregular heartbeats, and eventually cardiac arrest. So both these toxins are obviously bad news, but both are related to the sodium channels, either being forced closed or forced open. So as you can see, the sodium channels are very important. They need to be working just right or else you start having problems. So as was mentioned briefly before, the action potential propagates down the, the axon at the same strength. This is because the process repeats itself at each segment of the axon. Um, the axon at the previous section leads to depolarization at the next, which causes the sodium channels to open, etc. This is called slow conduction because it actually only moves at a rate of roughly 10 meters per second, which you'll see is actually quite slow for how these things go. And um, also, because of the absolute refractory periods, the action potentials can only go one way down the atom. They can only go down. They can't go back the other way. So, as you see here, with the slow conduction, you have the action potential here. You can't go back this way because it's refractory. So you have the action potential. And this effect sits off this side because at the net segment, it causes that to depolarize. And then that fires and it causes the net segment to depolarize. And it just moves that way down the cell. So it's the same process happening again and again and again, all the way down the cell, or down the axon. The conduction velocity, which is how fast the signal can travel down the axon, actually depends on a few factors. For one, the larger an axon is, typically the faster the depolarization will spread. Um, so this process, the slow conduction, actually happens a little faster if the axon is larger. Also, myelination makes a big difference. This is where the, this is the really big difference. So because the myelin insulates um, the axon and reduces resistance, it actually um, changes the flow, the ionic flow across the membrane. So what happens is actually with the myelination, the action potential can jump from node of Ranvier to node of Ranvier. This process is known as saltatory conduction. Um, saltatory conduction is much faster than um, the slow conduction we just talked about. It actually goes at roughly 150 meters per second. So it's 15 times faster than when an axon is not myelinated. So what happens is instead of having the action potential here and having it, you know, set off the net segment and the net segment and the net segment. You have the action potential here and it can jump all the way down to the next node of Renvier. Action potential all the way down to the next node. So each action potential gets a lot more bang for your buck and that's why it's a lot faster. So the signals pass down the axon um, and then with this, it gets down to the neurotransmitters. So what happens then? Well, the neurotransmitters can cause what's called a postsynaptic potential. So here, we'll talk more about neurotransmitters later. So this is the signal got down to the axon. It fired. Neurotransmitters went to the next one. So postsynaptics are on the dendrite after. Um, the result of the neurotransmitters being received is you have these postsynaptic potentials, which are brief changes in the resting potential of the cell. These can either be inhibitory or excitatory, depending on what neurotransmitter is received. We'll talk a lot about this in later chapters. So inhibitory um, postsynaptic potentials, or IPSPs, um, result in chloride items or ions, I can't talk, sorry, chloride ions, so negative ions moving into the cell, making it more negative. So 
This hyperpolarization makes it harder to get to the magic negative 140 millivolts and thus is inhibitory. It makes it less likely that the cell will fire. However, since it takes some time um, for the neurotransmitters to be released and to take hold um, in the postsynaptic dendrite, this process isn't immediate. Thus, there's also a synaptic delay, which is the de delay between an action potential reaching the axon terminal and then the creation of a postsynaptic potential. This delay is primarily due to the time that it takes for the calcium ions to either um, to enter the presynaptic cell and the signals, um, the synaptic vesicles, this process, I should say, signals the synaptic vesicles to release the neurotransmitters into the synapse. So what you'll see on these coming slides is now we're getting these excitatory and these inhibitory potentials. So the neurons do what we call information processing, which is basically integrating these synaptic inputs in order to figure out whether to fire or not. So the postsynaptic neuron will fire um, if the depolarization is great enough that it reaches the threshold at the axon hillock. So unlike an action potential, um, these inhibitory and excitatory potentials weaken as they travel through the cell. And thus, usually one excitatory um, is not strong enough to cause the cell to fire. So in this example, you actually have two excitatory potentials arriving at the axon hillock together. Since the effects are combined, it's enough to depolarize the cell over the threshold and cause the cell to fire. However, the inhibitory potentials also play a role. So what you have here is the same two positive potentials, excitatory potentials, reaching the Edson hillock, but you also have two negative potentials, two inhibitory potentials, reaching the Edson hillock. So with this, all these are summed or combined, and because you have both the um, inhibitory with the excitatory, you don't quite reach that threshold. So because of that, the cell would not fire in this case. So the process of combining potentials that come from different parts of the cell and summing these is called spatial summation. So as you can see, it's the summing of these potentials. Um, it's important to mention that since these potentials do degrade, the process is affected by distance. So ones that are closer to the Edson hillock will have a greater effect than those that are further away. Um, okay. So here we're getting both excitatory and inhibitory potentials. But as you can see, the excitatory potentials are just enough to depolarize the cell, causing the cell to fire. Temporal summation is the summing of potentials that arrive at the Edson hillock at different times. So again, as time passes, either due to the amount of time or distance they have to travel, or time they have to sit there, these signals degrade. So the closer together in time that the signals arrive, the greater the summation and the greater the possibility of an action potential. So here's an example of when they all get to the cell at the same time, or the axon helix at the same time. So note how the cell quickly depolarizes. You see, there's your depolarization, and the cell fires because they all got there at the same time. So you had three excitatory signals at once. However, when they arrive at different times, they don't build off each other as nicely. And because of this, each potential has some um, dissipation. So this makes it harder for the cell to fire, though it eventually does, it just takes longer. So you see, you know, little depolarization, little depolarization. Then the third time it finally gets it, and you have the same strength of a firing, of course, because of that all or nothing, but it just takes longer to get to that threshold to fire. 